Think about what it would be like to be locked up in solitary confinement forever and ever and never again to have any friendships or relationships with anyone anywhere. Think about being left alone for eternity with your thoughts and your regrets and your memories and your missed opportunities. When the rich man is seen in Hades in Luke chapter 16, the Bible tells us he is alone. He's by himself. So don't let anybody come with that crazy nonsense. Oh, you guys go to heaven where it's going to be boring, and we're going to the other place, and we're going to party forever and ever. I promise you, the first moment you spend in hell, you will know how absolutely stupid and ridiculous such a thought is. That's not where, that's not where joy is to be found. Joy is to be found in the presence of the one who made you, who created you for joy, who created you to be filled with rejoicing and pleasure that's the God we serve, and he's created a place where you can know that to its fullest. And if you miss it, there's no other place where that can be found. Our lives are divided into days, our days into moments. And sometimes a moment is all it takes for God to encourage us, meet us in our deepest need, and strengthen us to face the day. What will your next moment with God bring you? In Moments with God, Dr. David Jeremiah has crafted 365 thoughts designed to encourage powerful daily moments between you and the Lord. This beautiful soft leather devotional features 365 daily devotions that include scripture readings and biblical insights from Dr. Jeremiah to help you grow each day, an ideal companion to your Bible study. The Moments with God 365 day devotional can be yours for a gift of any amount. This devotional is also perfect for sharing with others. And with a generous gift of $120 or more in support of this program, you'll receive a four-pack of Moments with God. Find the perfect moment to share Jesus with someone you know. Thank you for your support of the Ministry of Turning Point. Request Moments with God today. Somebody once told me that it was a truth so simple it didn't need to be written about. And I said, no, it's a truth so profound I don't feel worthy to write about it. You know, a lot of people are really confused about God's love. He doesn't love the way we do. We love others because of what they do for us. He loves us because it's his nature to love. And when you know the love of God, it's the most amazing thing. I was looking for a way to help people simply understand God's love. And the love of God is like a universe you've never been to before. And when you try to understand it from God's perspective, you know, we're not equipped to do that. And what I've tried to do in God Loves You, He Always Has and He Always Will, is to echo the heart of God to the people of the world. The interesting thing about knowing God is to realize that God has always loved us and it's just the most wonderful thing when we discover that because then we can start loving Him back. The Bible actually says God is love. When you know that, you know, when you know somebody loves you, when you know God loves you, it makes all the difference. Connect with Turning Point on the go, anytime, anywhere. Download the newly redesigned Turning Point app to listen to Turning Point Radio, watch Turning Point Television, read daily devotionals, and more. Plus, for the young ones in your life, the new Airship Genesis Pathway to Jesus mobile game, an engaging narrative puzzle adventure game that explores the life of Jesus. Available now on the App Store. As I look back over my life, I have a mental picture of every house or apartment that I have ever lived in. Beginning with the house my parents lived in when I was born in Toledo, Ohio, to my present location in El Cajon, California, I can picture every single one of those places. Altogether, I have lived in 15 different homes, and I can recall something special about each one. 
But you know, there are two of the 15 that are more special than the others, and I remember them with much greater clarity. Uh, first was my home in Cedarville, Ohio, where my brother and my two sisters and I grew up together as a family. And the other is the house where we moved to San Diego and we reared our two boys and our two girls. And those two places are really, they're above and beyond the other places where we've lived. They were more important to us because they were more than just dwelling places. These were centers of activity and personal interaction, not just between the members of our family, but all the people that came and went and all the friends that we have that have been in those homes the people that we have loved and wanted to be with have been in those houses, and for that reason, they're sacred to us. When my siblings and I became adults and we began our own journeys in life, obviously we moved out of our parents' house, but we never stopped going back. In fact, at Christmas and during vacation days, we would find our way back home. When Don and I were in Dallas, Texas, and I was a graduate student at Dallas Seminary, on at least three occasions that we can remember we would come home from work on Friday night and look at each other and say, let's go home. And we'd get in our car. At that time, I had a white Chevrolet convertible with a red top. And uh, we'd get in that car, and we'd drive from Dallas, Texas to Cedarville, Ohio. But I remember it was 1,051 miles one way. And we'd drive there straight through so we could spend about eight hours at home and then get in the same car and drive back so we didn't miss class or work on Monday. You say, that's crazy. Yeah, it is. It's crazy, but it illustrates the fact that home is like a magnet. If you have a home, you want to go home as much as you can. We were homesick. We wanted to go home. Today, we are a nation of nomads. I don't know if you know that or not, but on the average, we make 11.7 moves during a lifetime. Something within us, however, always looks back. Even now, when I go back to Cedarville, Ohio, which I do on an occasion, I find a way to drive by that house where I grew up. I just want to see that it's still there. There's something about that that makes you feel good when you see the house where you grew up. And I sense that today the house we have in El Cajon is like that for our children. And I want to remind them that we have no intentions of, of downsizing in that home very soon. We're going to stay there as long as we can. Well, the Bible tells us that we all have at least one more move. Did you know that? One more house to live in that we haven't lived in yet. Uh, and we don't know when that's going to happen, but the Bible says one day we're going to go to heaven. And uh, in John 14, my favorite name for heaven is listed. You know what it is? Here it is. It's called the Father's house. That's the name for heaven in John 14. Say that with me. The Father's house. That's where we're going to go. One of these days, we're going to move in to the Father's house. This picture of heaven as the Father's house is given to us to remind us that one day soon we're going to be with the one we love and the ones that we love in the Father's house. How many of you know that when you love somebody, you want to be with them? Have you noticed when a couple falls in love, they're inseparable? That's how it works. When you love somebody, you want to be with them. Amen? Amen. And here's the incredible news. God says he wants to be with us. He wants us to be with him. In fact, if you go through the New Testament, you will see this little phrase salted into the language of the New Testament over and over again. For instance, in that passage in John 14, I mentioned uh, the end of the verse says that Jesus is preparing this house so that where he is, there we may be also. Have you ever noticed that? He wants us to be where he's going to be. John 17, 24, Jesus in his high priestly prayer prays this, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. Jesus wants us to be with him. When he gave his assurance to the thief on the cross, do you remember what he said to him? He said, today you will be with me in paradise. How many of you know God wants us to be with him? Jesus wants us to be with him. Paul explained it in his own death, and he said this, we are confident, yes, we're pleased rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. When he wrote to the Philippians, he said, I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, 
which is far better. You see how this keeps reoccurring over and over? God wants us to be with him. And after he teaches us about the rapture, at the end of the verse in 1 Thessalonians 4, he gives us this little caveat, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Speaking of heaven, have you noticed that hardly anybody talks about it anymore? Someone said, you know, we talk about eschatology, we don't talk about heaven. <laughs> Why don't we talk about heaven? Because we're so enamored with earth. We're so enamored with all the stuff we have down here. We can't get our eyes off of it. And every year I go to Louisville and I speak there to the Southern Gospel Music Quartet Convention. And uh, there's a lot of folks that go to that and I always say pretty much the same thing somewhere in the time that I'm there that I want them to know how grateful I am because they have preserved the music of heaven. Nobody else writes music about heaven except country and western people and southern gospel. We have forgotten it. We don't write hymns about it. We don't write worship choruses about it. We have become so earthly minded we don't want to worry about heaven. Often people tell me they don't understand why we should be concerned about heaven. I mean, after all, if you're all heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. Have you heard that? But C.S. Lewis answered that question pretty definitively in his classic Mere Christianity. Here's what he said. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next world. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become ineffective in this world. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you don't get either one. And he's right. Heaven is real and our heavenly father and his son Jesus Christ are there and they're making things ready for our eternal home. I often tell people, can you imagine how beautiful heaven is going to be? The Lord Jesus spent six days creating the earth as we see it now. He's been working on heaven for how many years? It's going to be quite a fantastic place. So since he wants us to be with him where he is, let me tell you a little bit about that place. First of all, heaven is the ultimate residence. It's the place of ultimate residence. In the Bible, we're told in John chapter 14 that in this place are many mansions. I read about a law firm that sent flowers to an associate in another city. They were celebrating the opening of a new office. And through some mix-up, the card that accompanied the floral piece read, Deepest Sympathy. When the florist was informed of his mistake, he let out a cry of alarm. Good heavens, he said. The card that went with the flowers to the funeral home said, Congratulations on your new location. That's the point I want to make. We have a new location, don't we? Almighty God has provided a new location for us. It's the ultimate residence. And it's where our Heavenly Father is. Psalm says, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. Now, I know you know a lot of folks, as I do, who talk about heaven kind of in a, an imaginary way. Uh, they, they think about heaven as an imaginary place. They put their tongue in their cheek and they smile knowingly and they say, well, you know, heaven's, if you need it, heaven is there. Heaven's a human invention, a never-never land, a realm of dreams, not to take it seriously. But I'm here to tell you today that heaven is not a figment of our imagination. It is not a feeling or an emotion. Heaven is not the beautiful isle of somewhere. Heaven is not merely a thought form. It's not a projection of the best in each of us. In heaven, we are going to experience the presence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And heaven is a location far more real than where you presently live. It is a real place where God lives. It is the real place from which Christ came into this world. And it's the real place to which Christ returned at his ascension. Really, heaven is that place. It's the ultimate residence. This ultimate residence is also a place of ultimate rejoicing. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The Bible says that in heaven there's fullness of joy, there's the path of life, and there is pleasure forevermore. Heaven is going to be a pleasurable place. Let me put it down where you can grab it. Heaven's going to be fun. <laughs> Huckleberry Finn didn't think so. In the opening chapter of Mark Twain's classic, 
The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Huck is living with a starchy, crabby old woman who has determined in her life that her one objective is to transform Huckleberry Finn. And she's going to beat the wildness out of him and fill him full of manners. And the chief way she plans to do this is with religion. So she bludgeons him with Bible verses and she threatens him with hell and she coaxes him with heaven. And in his streetwise cocky way, Huck tells us what he thinks of all that. He says, she went on and told me all about the good place. She said all a buddy would have to do to go there and just go around all day with a harp and sing forever. And I didn't think much of it. And I asked her if she reckoned Tom Sawyer would go there. And she said, not by a considerable sight. And I was glad about that because I wanted him and me to be together. <laughs> when you mention heaven to someone who's not a Christian, let me tell you what their reaction is. And I'll even tell you how it comes out. It comes out like this. Boring. Heaven's going to be boring. I need to tell you, heaven is not going to be boring. Mark Buchanan is a writer that I've read some, and he admits to the fear that heaven might be the extension of modern-day boring church services. In one of his books, he writes, I assume that you're like me. I can get itchy-skinned and scratchy-throated after an hour or so of church. I can get distracted and cranky when it goes too long. My feet ache, my backside numbs, my eyes glaze, my mind fogs, my belly growls. I find myself fighting back yawns and then not fighting them back. Letting them gape and roar, a signal to my oppressors, let my people go. <laughs> and I'm the pastor. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are a lot of Christians who believe that heaven will be boring. All we'll do forever is strum harps and float on clouds and polish the streets of gold. But heaven will not be boring, and I want to tell you why. The greatest book on heaven that's been written in my lifetime was written by a guy named Randy Alcorn, and it just has the title Heaven. And this is what he says about this whole boring thing. He says, our belief that heaven will be boring betrays a heresy, that God is boring. And there is no greater nonsense. Now think about this. Your desire, my desire for pleasure and the experience of joy come directly from God's hand. He made our taste buds. He created adrenaline. He gave us our sex drives and the nerve endings that convey pleasure to our brains. Our imaginations and our capacity for joy and exhilaration were made by the very God we accuse of being boring. Are we so arrogant that we imagine that as human beings we came up with fun? Added to the fact that God will not be boring is this amazing truth. Sit up and listen. It's true whether you believe it or not. In heaven, you won't be boring. <laughs> I know that's going to take more faith than what I said about God, but let me tell you something. The Bible teaches that. When you get to heaven, you're not going to be boring either. You know why? The Bible says before you get there, you're going to have a complete extreme makeover. Amen? Amen. The Bible says we're going to be made like unto him. All the things in you that are boring are going to be gone. And when you get to heaven, it's going to be life at, at the greatest. Everything in heaven will be the absolute opposite of boring. I don't know where we get these ideas, but when you have people come up and tell you that heaven's going to be boring, you just tell them they don't know what they're talking about. Sometimes they even go further. And sometimes uh, you hear people say this, I don't want to go to heaven and be bored every day. I'd rather be with all my friends and party forever and ever. And that's just another one of the devil's lies. Because you see, hell is not a place of fun and games where we spend forever drinking with our old buddies. Hell will have no community and no camaraderie and no friendships. In the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9, we read these words about people who go there. It says, they will be punished with everlasting destruction. Now, here's the worst part. And shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. Think about what it would be like to be locked up in solitary confinement forever and ever and never again to have any friendships or relationships with anyone anywhere. 
Think about being left alone for eternity with your thoughts and your regrets and your memories and your missed opportunities. When the rich man is seen in Hades in Luke chapter 16, the Bible tells us he is alone. He's by himself. So don't let anybody come with that crazy nonsense. Oh, you guys go to heaven where it's going to be boring and we're going to the other place and we're going to party forever and ever. I promise you the first moment you spend in hell, you will know how absolutely stupid and ridiculous such a thought is. That's not where, that's not where joy is to be found. Joy is to be found in the presence of the one who made you, who created you for joy, who created you to be filled with rejoicing and pleasure that's the God we serve, and he's created a place where you can know that to its fullest. And if you miss it, there's no other place where that can be found. Heaven's a place of ultimate residence and ultimate rejoicing. It's also a place of ultimate recognition. It says in 1 Corinthians 13, For now we see in a mirror, but then face to face. We know in part now, but then we will know as we are known. Here's the question people ask me. Pastor Jeremiah, are we going to know each other in heaven? Absolutely. When you go to heaven, you don't lose your identity, your personality, your DNA, who you are. In fact, if you study the Lord Jesus Christ who went through the process we're going to go through before he went back to heaven, you discover that after his resurrection, his disciples all knew who he was. They knew he was the same Jesus they had known before the cross and the burial and the resurrection, and they were so certain about this, they went to their graves defending it. When Moses and Elijah appeared out of heaven to stand with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, the disciples with Christ recognized Moses and Elijah. Oh, when you get to heaven, you're going to know each other all right. Matthew 8, 11 says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. They're going to know each other, and we're going to know each other. When you get to heaven, you're going to know your parents and your children. You're going to know your brothers and your sisters. You're going to know the people that you grew up knowing, the people that were in the church you attended, and you're going to know so many more, as we'll learn in a moment. But you don't lose your memory when you go to heaven any more than Jesus lost his memory after his resurrection. When you get to heaven, it's the ultimate place of recognition. A lady in Tony Evans' church once asked him if you would know each other in heaven. He said, you won't know each other till you get to heaven the way you really should know each other. Because down here we have all these masks and all these things we use to cover up who we really are. But when you get to heaven, all that stuff will be gone and you'll be able to see the beauty that's in each one of us that God has put there before we started to tamper with it. Heaven is the ultimate place of residence and the ultimate place of rejoicing and the ultimate place of recognition. But it's also the place of ultimate relationships. In heaven, we're going to have relationships with one another. Hebrews 12 tells us about some of the people who are going to be in heaven. Notice Hebrews 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, or to heaven, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, to the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. That's quite a list. The Bible says basically all the people that have been saved, the angels, God himself, everybody's going to be there. And you've come to that place. And you're going to have relationships with people in heaven. I often think about this because, you know, there's lots of folks that I've met in this life that I've become friends with and I enjoy being with them. But I'm a reader and I live in, in my library a lot and I read and, and I actually get to know people who aren't here anymore, who lived before I lived. They lived in a different time. And I get to know a lot about them almost as if I could, I could uh, have fellowship with them, but I can't because they're dead, they're gone. But in heaven, we're all going to be together and it will be possible for us to fellowship with people who lived at times other than when we lived. And I have some great, great thoughts about that. I mean, I'd like to meet Daniel and Joseph and David, the three people from the Old Testament that are my favorite Old Testament characters. I've preached on them, and now they can tell me how much I got wrong when, when I see them. <laughs> I'd like to meet Jabez and ask him if he ever dreamed Bruce Wilkinson would make him so famous. <laughs> I'd love to cultivate a relationship with Paul the Apostle and John the Beloved. And I owe a lot to men like C.S. Lewis, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Andrew Murray, A.W. Tozer, 
whose books I've read, whose words I've quoted, whose, whose testimony has so shaped my life. And when I get to heaven, I'll get to meet them and fellowship with them, and there will never be any time constrictions. I can have lunch with them, and it could last for two or three months, and they're still, see, there won't be any time. You never run out of time in heaven. You'll be able to cultivate all the relationships. But I want to tell you something, as great as all of that will be, it all pales into insignificance when you realize that the privilege of heaven is not just the people you get to meet there, but living in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ himself and living in fellowship with him. Heaven's going to be a place of ultimate residence and rejoicing and recognition and relationships, but it's also going to be a place of ultimate responsibility. Matthew 25 says, when we get to heaven, we're going to hear these words, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. Now, it doesn't end there. Notice the rest of it. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. When we get to heaven, we're going to serve the Lord. For years, I have been collecting the sayings that people put on their tombstones. Here's one that expresses what some people think about heaven. Here lies a poor woman who always was tired. She lived in a place where help wasn't hired. Her last words on earth were, Dear friends, I am going, where, where washing ain't done, nor sweeping, nor sewing, and everything there is exact to my wishes, for there they don't eat, there's no washing of dishes. Don't weep for me now, don't weep for me ever. I'm going to do nothing forever and ever. That's what she thinks heaven's all about. <laughs> but it won't be like that. If you read the book of Revelation, I want you to notice over and over again in that book all the times you read about the servants of the Lord. In heaven, we're going to be his servants. We're going to serve him. Revelation 22, 3 says, There will be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And when we serve him in heaven, it will be, oh, so unbelievably great. Imagine working in an environment free from restrictions of time and money and selfishness and greed and sickness and tiredness and laziness and pain and frustration and even mistakes. How incredibly satisfying and rewarding it will be to serve in heaven, doing what you love to do with people you love to be with and all for the glory of God. That's how we'll spend eternity in the Father's house. There will never be a boring day. You know what? I'm kind of encouraged by that. I, I, I'm sure you've noticed this. I love the work that God has given me to do. I can't imagine a, a life with no goals, a life with no work to do, a life with no projects. I mean, that's how I've lived my whole life. And when I get to heaven, it's just going to be exploded into perfection. And I'll be able to live every day. And I won't have to ever argue with anybody about what I want to do and hear them say, no, you won't. I'm going to be able to do the things that God puts in my heart to do forever and ever. And I'm going to serve the Lord out of purity of heart and motive. That's what heaven will be like. And then heaven will be a place of ultimate reality. And let me just dwell on that for a moment and we're finished. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 and in Romans 8 that all of us today, as we live our lives, we have a groaning within us. That's what it says, we groan within ourselves. What does that mean? It means that in our hearts, and, and look up here for a moment, in our hearts we all know there's something more than what we're experiencing. You know, you have your best day and, and you revel in it for a moment and then you realize, oh, it's over. <laughs> I watch the NBA playoffs and see how hard these guys work to try to win the NBA title. But you know, they win the NBA title and people hear about it and for about a week, everybody remembers it. And about six months later, you ask them, who won the NBA title last year? They can't remember who it was. They have this ultimate joy for a moment when the confetti comes out of the ceilings and everybody cheers and they have their parade back home and then the excitement and, and all of it, it just fades away. And sometimes the aftermath of the joy is almost worse than not having had it. The Bible says that we are created as humans with a hunger in our heart that can be satisfied with nothing other than God himself and God's place called the Father's house. And when we get to heaven one day, we're going to realize that God did put eternity in our hearts, Ecclesiastes 3, and that eternity is that 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 sense within us that nothing is fully complete till we get to heaven. 
And here's the interesting thing about it. God made us that way on purpose. He made us so that we could never be fully actualized on the earth. Some of you, as I have, have traveled abroad and you have been in other cultures and it's fun to go there, but have you ever noticed how uneasy you feel while you're there? You don't know the language, you don't know the culture, you don't know how to order anything, you don't know how to tell people where you wanna go. And you just, you just sort of feel, you know, you're there, you're enjoying the scenery, you're glad you went, but you know this is not home. That's the way it is for us. How many of you know this world is not our home? We're just passing through. Our home is in heaven. Our home is the Father's house. And the reason we feel so uncomfortable sometimes down here, and so out of sorts, and especially if you're Christians, you sort of feel like, you know, why, why do I, listen, you're not home yet. But when you get home, when you get to heaven, eternity's gonna click in, and you're gonna realize this is what I was created for. This is what God made me for, to know this ultimate joy, this ultimate reality of heaven. And it won't be something that fades out in the day that follows, but it will be something that grows and appreciates and becomes better and better as you live out through eternity. There'll never be any disappointment. There'll never be any, oh, I wish it were like it used to be. It will always be better than it was and ever and ever the fulfillment of God in our hearts. God loves you and he wants you to be with him forever. I'll tell you what, uh, I'm ready to go to heaven and I, I'm, anytime God wants me there, I'm, I'm sure he knows when that is. He doesn't tell me and I'm glad for that because I'm like the little boy who was in class one day and the teacher said, how many of you want to go to heaven when you die? And everybody raised their hand but a little boy sitting in the back row. And the teacher went back there and she said, Johnny, don't you want to go to heaven? He said, yeah. She said, don't you want to go to heaven when you die? Oh, he said, yeah, when I die, but I thought you were getting up a load for today. You know, you know, no, 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 I don't want to go today. I'm anxious to be here as long as I can. I'll tell you one of the reasons why, I hope you'll hear my heart in this. I want to take as many people to heaven with me as I can. That's what radio and television is all about. That's what the magazines are all about. That's what church is all about. That's what witnessing and, and, and events and arenas and all the stuff, it's all about this thing. I want to take as many people to heaven as I can. I want to tell them about Jesus and let them know how great that place is, amen? And that ought to be our heart. We ought not to just be happy that we're going there. We ought to be so, uh, we ought to be so amped up about it that we want to tell everybody how great it is and how they can get there and not miss that place we've been talking about today. That place of ultimate residence and ultimate rejoicing and ultimate recognition and ultimate relationships and ultimate responsibility and ultimate reality. That's heaven. That's the Father's house. And the only way you can get there is through Jesus Christ. Jesus one day said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. You can't get to the Father's house unless you go through Jesus. He's the only one who can get you there. You can't get there by your own good works. You can't get there by going to church. You can't get there by being a Baptist or a Pentecostal or a Catholic or a Mormon or any other kind of religious thing. You can only get there through Jesus. And he's, he's come to this earth to be like you and like me. Walked among us for those years and then ultimately went to the cross and paid the penalty for all of our sin. And now he says, if you will accept my sacrifice on the cross and allow it to be the full payment for all the sin you've committed in your life or ever will commit, then you can be born again and you can become a citizen of heaven. All of us in this room who are on our way to heaven aren't going there because we're good. We're going there because we realize that one day Jesus invited us to come. It's going to be a party like you won't believe. And we're all invited, but only if you accept the invitation to get to go. I've been telling you how much God loves you. I've been telling you that he loves you, that he always has, that he always will, and that's true. But maybe I haven't told you enough that you don't get that love unless you receive it. Dr. Jeremiah just told me how much God loved me. It was so great. No, 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 if that's all you hear, if that's all you understand from these messages, you're going to miss it. God loves you, that's true, but he wants you to receive that love by receiving his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into your heart.
Nothing is as profound as the Word of God. And now, Dr. Jeremiah has a Bible for every member of the family. There are numerous versions of the Jeremiah Study Bible, perfect for adults and teens. And the Airship Genesis Kids Study Bible will bring the truth of God's Word to the young ones in your life. For more information or to order, go to davidjeremiah.org slash Bible. And now, with one last word for today's program, here is Dr. Jeremiah. A message like this begs the obvious question. Are you prepared for the day when you will cross from this life to the next? We never know when that transition will happen. So the wise person prepares today for what could happen at any time. According to the Bible, being prepared to enter heaven means receiving the gift of God's love as seen in the person of Jesus Christ. I would love to help you know Christ and settle the issue of where you will spend eternity. If you will contact us, I'll send you two Turning Point resources that will help you understand how heaven is a real expression of God's love. One is our booklet called Your Greatest Turning Point, and the other is called Turning Points, our monthly devotional magazine. We will gladly send both to you free of charge if you will contact us here at Turning Point today.